Um, I got somebody here, my Christian friend James, who has read uh, two of your papers on this, and he's interested in asking you a question or two about it. So I promised him that I would bring him on, and so here he is. Um, James, how's it going? It's going good. Just trying to get my camera to be positioned. It's actually kind of weird, Jake, because like you're you're down, and then he's taller than you, <laughs> and then yeah. just like this big massive head in the camera frame. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, man. No, I enjoyed so, I enjoyed the papers. Um, I think I enjoyed the second one um, better when you're talking about subordinism. I really enjoyed oh, yeah. that one. Yeah, I feel like I finally figured out how to state the arguments much better uh, by the time I got to that paper. Yeah. I didn't even realize there was like four different types of subordinism until I started to like dig in on that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I think I feel more comfortable with economic subordinism um, than anything. But I, the question that I was having was, when you were talking about a Sadie and how a Sadie's not a shared, like I couldn't share my existence with my son. Um, but God being that he is for lack of a better term, non-existence, non-created. So are you saying that within the three persons that they all share a Sadie within your conclusion? I think that's what you have to say if you want the homoousius claim that they have the same essence. So whatever the great making properties are that make something divine, that make it the greatest possible being, if the divine persons all share that essence, they have to have all those properties. And so if one of them is auseity, which is like, you know, not having a cause for your existence, then you can't be caused to have auseity. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, and then um, within the divine emptying of Christ, and Christ not potentially knowing things that the Father knows. Mm -hmm. um, now I have my knee-jerk answer, which is just that it's Jewish custom and the Father would call the wedding date. But sometimes that's not necessarily sufficient. What is kind of your take on how Christ would know something, sharing the same aseity in nature, but or the Father would know something and Christ not know it? Right. So this is unrelated to Ossate. It's related to a different way you could develop the argument. So one way you could go is to say, well, um, you know, if, if, if you're supposed to be like uh, divine, you know, all the things, well, the son doesn't know all the things. So ooh, he's not, he's not fully divine. Um, and so there's two, there's several different kinds of moves you could make. Um, one is you, the, the standard moves, like you have two minds. Um, so the divine mind that the son has, you know, he, that knows all the stuff, but the human mind doesn't know any, doesn't know all the things. Um, another way to go is to say, uh, like the economic move that you pointed out to say, well, he's making a particular economic claim about this is the father is supposed to have this, uh, the authority to declare these sort of dates, the son doesn't or whoever. So I think those are good moves. If you go with a canonic account, um, where the son empties himself of certain things. So he empties himself, uh, of, um, maybe he doesn't like give up his, uh, omniscience and omnipotence, but he limits the exercise of those properties to the point of being, uh, to really undergo the human experience. Uh, if you say that, then I think you need to do something different with your understanding of omniscience in order to avoid the kind of problem that you're pointing out. Uh, what you need to do there is to say omniscience is not really the great making property. The great making property is maximal cognitive excellence, the ability to know all things. Because the ability to know all things is more fundamental than, in fact, knowing all things. And so if it's an ability, if it's a power, well, you can exercise that as you want. Um, and so what you could say is the son has a very good reason to not fully exercise this power for the sake of being incarnate for whatever his earthly ministry is. I think that's how you have to go if you want some kind of canonic account is to make something like that. So you have to not necessarily fiddle with your understanding of omniscience, but go, there's something deeper here. Uh, omniscience isn't really the great making property, but this maximal cognitive excellence that's, that's underneath that, that's the real property. And then you don't have this kind of worry about um, a, a, like some kind of like subordination or something going on in the, in the father and son, but there's, no, yeah, it, it needs, it needs a lot more work though. Um, something like that. It, it, has, I, it needs I a lot more bells and whistles. It's definitely something that I can uh, look into. Um, so with rejecting, like eternally begotten, um, the the spirit not being created or proceeding from the father or the son. Um, how does that, how do you, within the orthodoxy, because I hear the argument, I know you kind of touched on it lightly, was that the church guided, was guided into these things by the Holy Spirit. 
Um, what would kind of be your response to that? I would want to go, well, well, the Holy Spirit didn't do a very good job um, of guiding them, I guess, because it's incoherent and it's not biblical. So, ooh, um, yeah, so I guess I would kind of call into question whether or not it really is the case that the Holy Spirit uh, guided the church in these sorts of things. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of people are not going to like that at all. But but that's, I mean, that's basically how I see it. No, no, I, I appreciate your time and hitting up those questions. Um, I definitely look forward to reading more of your papers. I really, really enjoyed the two I did. And I uh, definitely, after I read up more on the subordinism and the other two that I wasn't really sure out of the four, um, I may have more questions. Sure. Um, now, something James might want you to address, uh, we didn't touch on it too much. Um, you did mention it, and you do mention it in your paper. Um but I think you argue, and others who deny this doctrine, such as William Lane Craig, don't think that um, there's much scriptural warrant for it. And so because of that, and because of the fact that you guys are Protestants, <laughs> you're not really so binded to the creeds, um, maybe an explanation of that would help people like James, who is a Christian, mm -hmm. who's thinking about this, and he's a Protestant, but he has a concern about, you know, being in conformity with orthodoxy a little bit, um, maybe explaining that you don't think it's actually a biblical doctrine that Christians need to hold to uh, would help some, some of the audience. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember all the details off the top of my head, but yeah. if you look at my paper, um, Divine Temporality, the Trinity, and the Charge of Arianism, I go through the biblical case there. Um, so the main claim is um, this, this phrase monogenes is used to describe the Son. And so what some people in the early church did was they said that that phrase means begotten, uh, which is this causal notion that we've been talking about in this, in, in this episode. Well, what a bunch of New Testament scholars have pointed out is to say, well, no, uh, it doesn't mean uh, cause or anything like that. It means unique. Uh, and in fact, it's used to, uh, to describe the relationship between um, Abraham and Isaac. Isaac's uh, son, uh, or sorry, Isaac is Abraham's son. Well, he's unique. And like, was he like, like somehow like eternally caused to like eternally exist? Well, no, no, that's not the claim um, at all. So it's it's a, it's just it just means simply unique. Uh, and so when you look at the biblical claims, it just doesn't look like anything remotely like what's going on in the doctrine of processions. Um, and so a lot of this, and that's what really generated a lot of this 20th century pushback. Going, this just has zero biblical basis. Now, my general strategy, and I think what a lot of Protestants and evangelicals do, is they want to say, you know, I'm one person, I can only know so much. I just assume that all the people in the church had good reasons for their theological positions. So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt until I am in a position that I can actually like, you know, investigate the matter myself and critique it and figure out if I want to accept it or reject it. And I think that's a good strategy. I mean, we do this all the time with science and, and with other things where we go, those people are experts. They probably had good reasons for saying this stuff. What people like me or William and Craig or you, you name it, um, what they're doing is we're looking at these and going, okay, well, we know there's no biblical evidence. We think we can demonstrate that there's an incoherence here. So we, when we really do feel like we've got good reasons then to push back and go, I, I see that these guys have, a, the, the church has authority, uh, the tradition has authority, but in this case, I've, I, can, I can give you reasons why I think that they are just outright wrong. Um, and so since there's no biblical basis for it and it goes against reason, we can just get rid of it. That's, that's the kind of basic methodology. Yep. Um, James, I don't, I don't know if you're still there, but, um, yeah, essentially what Dr. Mullins is saying is that, um, as a Christian, he has to bring all doctrines before the bar of scripture he doesn't necessarily see great mm -hmm. scriptural warrant for this doctrine of eternally begotten, and it goes against reason. Therefore, there's good reason to reject it or sort of cast it aside, even though great mm -hmm. theologians in the past have held this position. Um, we don't necessarily need to conform to their understanding. Uh, so I don't know if you want to comment on that, James, and because I have a question that I want to tie back into that conversation with Dr. Mullins, but no, I mean, I, I enjoyed his response. Um, for me, like I'm, I'm kind of solo scriptura. Like if I can't derive it from the text, then 
it's just not necessarily a theological position that I feel like mm -hmm. I'm bound to. Mm -hmm. um, I understand like if you're more uh, Greek Orthodox or you have certain things where you believe that the canyon might, can it, sorry, yeah, stuttering, that the canyon might be still opened into where these are words of God or if you suffer from my Catholic friends where the things that the Pope says is the words of God, I can see how it might be more of a problem for you, but I do agree from the Protestant perspective, I'm not uh, begetting to any of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing is, and this is something that um, I've spoken to James and other Christians about in the past, is that I would agree with uh, Ryan that I don't see much scriptural uh, support for the doctrine of divine processions. And that it's interesting that you touched on the word uh, monogenes and uh, begotten, as far as I can tell, most of the time when you see that, um, it doesn't seem like an eternal thing that's happening. Um, like you don't see eternally begotten really next to each other in the Bible, unless um, I'm missing something, Ryan, and you have an example of that. But I no. mean, as far as I can tell, I, I like we see begotten, even if we wanted to give that, but I never really see eternally begotten together in the same verse. So I don't know what you would think of that. One of the things I do in the the paper on Arianism and divine temporality, um, where I go through the biblical case, one of the things I point out is there is zero biblical support for divine timelessness. Uh, and since the doctrine of eternal processions is explicitly stated in terms of a timeless cause with a timeless effect, I'm like, oh, well, you've already, you've already started off on the bad, like the, like the wrong foot here. Uh, all of the T, uh, it, words for eternity in scripture are explicitly temporal terms. This has been known throughout all of church history. Uh, a, a lot of major thinkers like Augustine, Pseudo Dionysius, and so on actually point out like, well, this is a problem. We have to explain why all of these terms are temporal terms. So, ooh, okay. No timeless causes even mentioned in scripture. Um, so that's a problem. And then every case of the word monogenes being used, it's never mentioned in terms of like a cause that never began to exist, some sort of like the everlasting uh, cause is just, it's not used at all because it's always talking about some sort of unique person, a unique claim, never some sort of causal relationship that's go been going on from all eternity past. It's just, it's just not there. Yep. I mean, I, I mean, trying to be as unbiased right. as I can, I don't really see it either, to be honest with you. So I don't really see the necessity of the doctrine from a Christian perspective. Like James said, unless if you're a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox and you're pretty much bound to the creed, then yeah, it's a problem. But if you're a Protestant, um, like if I were a Protestant, I, if I were a Protestant, I would just go Ryan's route and pretty <laughs> much uh, just reject the doctrine, you know, I'd accept the Nicene Creed Um if I wanted to be a Trinitarian, but then I would just get rid of this um, understanding of divine processions. But you and I were talking about this the other day, Jake. We um, I was going through Wayne Grudem's book, Systematic yeah. Theology, yeah, and in the point. second edition, um, I don't know if you have that page that I sent you, but in the second point, he actually uh, his second book, um, I guess, revisiting and updating things. He actually adopted more of eternally begotten um, mm -hmm. instead of the unique event. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Have you? Are you familiar with Wayne Grunham? Yeah, I am, and I remember witnessing some of the debates take place over this when it became like a really. It was a really big hot issue when I was doing mm -hmm. my masters, and I actually had a public debate with him uh, uh, and Keith Yandel uh, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Um, I don't remember what all he does when he updates it. Because when I last saw him at a conference, which was several years ago, uh, I asked him, I raised some objections about this, and he hadn't fully revised his view yet. So I don't know what the end result is. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know what, it, what he eventually landed on. Because mm -hmm. I haven't read this section, um, but James was claiming that in his first work of systematic theology, he didn't include it. Right. And then in the second one, he included it and was basically saying... He was persuaded by some arguments, and now he was including it. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I think at minimum it shows that the doctrine's controversial, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, he did think about it and revise his position. So, 
Yeah, I don't know where he's at now with it. I guess. <laughs> you yeah, yeah. I guy. wish I had the exact quotations because that's really like we're bringing it up as we're, but I don't have the right. the quotations right in front of me, which is never good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure, but yeah, the whole thing with uh, that Ryan was bringing up as far as divine timelessness is that if you don't think that that's really a coherent doctrine. Um, then you're pretty much forced to reject it as a Trinitarian, as far as I can tell, because otherwise I think it's just going to naturally entail Arianism um, because of the fact, and this is where I would actually sort of agree with Paul Helm in his argument is that, well, if you affirm that God is in time in some respect, um, and this is a cause and effect, then it would just seem to follow that mm -hmm. the, you know, the cause would precede the effect. And then that would mean that the father causally or causally and temporally uh, proceed proceeds the, uh, the effects, which are the son and the spirit. And so that would be extremely problematic. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's interest an interesting point that you raised with Hasker is that I don't really see how he avoids that problem. Um, given mm -hmm. that he affirms that God is in time. Um, so so yeah. Hasker has, so, okay, so three thoughts. One, Paul Helm's an interesting case because he develops this argument over the years saying like, look, if you believe causes are, are temporally prior to their effects, you're literally going to have a time when the sun did not exist. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that just is the early Arian slogan. So right, you've got Arianism. And so he's aiming at Richard Swinburne. And so I think it's a brilliant argument. Mm -hmm. um, but then later on in, 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 in Paul's life, uh, like, like Paul Helm just goes, this whole causal thing that causes a problem for everyone. So this isn't just a problem for divine. This is a problem for all of us. And so he ends up rejecting it. Um, mm -hmm. the doctrine of processions because of this, uh, or at least defining it in a way where it's so vague and metaphorical that it's not causal anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, Hasker in his response to, to me, uh, he tries to address the, the the problem that Helm raises. So he has two responses, one of which is to say, well, for any time um, before that you could think of, well, the father was causing the son to exist and the son exists then. And you're like, well, what about the moment before that? Uh, well, you know, okay, sure. But the father was causing him before that. Okay, well, mm -hmm. what about the moment before that? Well, well, the father was causing him before that. And so you get this infinite regress and you never really get an explanation. So I don't think that one avoids it. But he's got the second reply that I think does avoid the problem where he says, well, I'll just give up uh, this, this principle that all causes are temporally prior to their effects. Mm -hmm. In the one case of God d divinely causing uh, the sun to exist, that's a simultaneous causation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, so you got a simultaneous causation. There you go. And so that's a way to get out of um, that version of the, air, the charge of Arianism because you don't have it where there's a time when the sun did not exist. Mm -hmm. You still have to deal with the rest of the problems, though, because you still have the sun being caused to exist. But at least, right. uh, at least, and get out of like this this version that Helms developed. Mm -hmm. I found that uh, quotation. Just if anybody wants to look it up later, it's page two ninety four of his second edition of Systematic Theology. Uh, Charles Lee Irons was the one who presented an argument in two thousand and seventeen. Um, he goes a couple pages on that, definitely won't read all that, but he says, the evidence of the arguments produced by Arns has convinced me that monogenes, which uh, was used of God, the Son, in the New Testament, means only begotten. As a result, I have removed Appendix 6, where I argued against only begotten, from this edition of Systematic Theology. In addition, I am now willing to affirm the doctrine of eternal generation of the Son, also called eternally begotten of the son. Hmm. Mm. So essentially he was persuaded in the opposite way that he thinks that those words do mean eternally begotten and, or begotten and not just unique in the way that uh, Ryan explained, hmm. which is interesting. Um, I don't know if you know, James, or if Ryan would know, cause I'm not, uh, I don't have like Wayne Grudem's systematic theology in my head, but what is his position on aseity? Um, because I'm wondering how uh, does he talk about the um, does he talk about aseity and self sufficiency as being necessary attributes of God? Um, 
Does he have a section on that? I think he has something within the three persons of the Trinity, the big chapter in here, but I don't have it off the top of my head, so I wouldn't want to put uh, mm -hmm. words in his mouth or misrepresent his position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm just wondering if in a systematic theology, I think he would go into a seity and talk about how it's an attribute of God, and I'm just wondering if he ever touched on that, and if he did, then how he would explain, given his position on uh, the divine processions, how he would mm -hmm. hold the two together. Um, so that may be something uh, my to try to jerk, research. My knee-jerk guess is going to be is he's probably trying to do what Ryan pointed out in his paper was an error, and he's trying to uh, say that a seity is something that could be shared from the Father to the Son because of the Son's eternally causeless, not created, proceeding from the Father. But that still is a problem because that's not what a seity means at face value. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not really sure how you respond to that. I did miss one super chat. It's not really a question, but it's, uh, he says perfect love equals self love, no sharing Quran 448, which is basically talking about that God shouldn't have associate partners. So, I mean, that's an interesting connection, I guess you could draw there, but, um, yeah, I mean, James, unless you have any other questions or, uh, questions for Dr. Mullins. I think it's about time or running on two hours and we address pretty much everything in the paper. Um, no, I'm so good. I, we're... I definitely, the other couple of papers he cited, if mm -hmm. you could get those from Dr. Mullins and forward them my way, I would love to read them, Jake, for sure. Okay. And what, just remind me, which ones were they? Um, he said it, uh, as a reply to one of my questions, I cannot remember what the paper was. We can go back, check the video later. And I okay, I think it might have been on the one of Arianism um, and I think divine that's temporality. It. Okay, so yes. my paper on Arianism. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That sounds you know, good. Definitely thank you for having me on. And uh, Dr. Mullins, thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. Of course. All right, James. Take care.